very nice to lecture in this room because I, I had uh, my undergraduate courses in measure theory and ergodic theory with Professor Klaus Schmidt, who was a former president of the Schrodinger Institute uh, in this very room. And, and uh, in the ergodic theory course, there were only two students at the end. One is Harald Oberhauser, he's now in Oxford, and the other one was me. And he had these expansive exams that were also held at these blackboards, which took hours. Uh, and it was great memories, and it's nice to be back here. Um, yeah, so I guess this is a slightly eclectic workshop, but it's great to have such a great audience around to maybe try to find some common ground. So, so I'm not going to talk about neural networks, even though there might be some points where one could introduce them. I'm giving more statistical talk targeted at some problems in that are kind of genuinely nonlinear, uh, where the nonlinearity, however, has some structure that comes from a partial differential equation. And, and so this is work I've been doing in the last five, six years or so, and, and uh, it's a bit of an overview talk, and, and maybe um, I'll, I'll give some more rigorous references at the end. Um, let's see. Okay, so, so basically we're doing a reg standard regression model where you have responses yi and you sort of measure some regression map or field or function at some discrete point xi and every time you make a measurement you make an additive gaussian error so that would be standard enough in regression just for notation these pairs of responses and covariates i will always call them dn uh, for the whole data vector um, so that's just notation and Typically, the responses could be scalar valued, but they could also just be vector valued. Yeah. So, so typically, when you do these PDE models, then the forward map might take even values in some space of operators, or let's just for the moment just take them to be a vector space of finite dimension. And uh, they are somehow indexed by a parameter space that will typically be high dimensional. You can model it as you like, but but somehow uh, the physical function that models the PD itself would belong to an infinite dimensional parameter, some function space. Yeah? Of course, you will discretize it later. Um, and uh, these problems are typically posed in some d-dimensional domain or manifold. Uh, so that means that these regression maps are indexed by some parameter theta that is sort of the unknown. But then whenever you have this unknown fixed, you still get a function that goes from the manifold into some vector space. Yeah? OK, so it's just nonlinear regression, really. But the parameterization um, it comes from a PD. Now, the inverse problems in the sort of mathematics community, these regression maps are not called regression maps, but they sort of write them down as a forward map that maps sort of the functional parameter that is maybe the coefficient of your partial differential equation into the solution of the PD. Uh, and so they have this G map that goes between two function spaces, which a regression a statistician might write this as G sub theta. Yeah? Um, and, and so somehow the regression maps are not just some general class, but they're very specific. Uh, come from a PD, I uh, will give some examples in a moment, but they are nonlinear, okay? Um, and so in the, in the sort of, you know, this, this has a wide range of uh, problems. You can start from pure mathematics and say, well, I just want to know whether this is an identifiable problem, which means to prove that G is injective. Yeah? Um, and so, you know, sometimes for some complicated PDs, this might be like a big annals of math paper where they prove something is injective, yeah? okay? And then, of course, you can go to the more sort of uh, concrete problems of actually determining this parameter theta by a concrete polynomial time algorithm uh, based on discrete observations, uh, maybe, for instance, of this regression type. Okay, and uh, so, so this regression model is very natural in, in these models when you want to model it in the, in the context of data science. Um, Examples abound in the whole world of applied mathematics, physics, and engineering. No, so partial differential equations are used all over the place to, to model, like, you know, everything from tomography to uh, X-ray transforms, weather forecasting, uh, ocean dynamics. Uh, you know, you can, you can typically use physical knowledge and then, you know, formulate it in a rigorous mathematical partial differential equation to describe certain physical phenomena. And the question is, can we exploit this PD structure to see sort of maybe specific features in our regression model that maybe makes it solvable in high dimensions. Yeah? Um, now, obviously, the complexity of these PDEs in applications in engineering can be vast. They write down some like you know big system of equations, and, and whether it has a solution or not, uh, often they don't really care, but they sort of have some, some guesses for that. Um, for the theory, 
will have to stick to some basic PDEs that encapsulate some of the, the, the main properties. So, so there are actually two examples that we understand now mathematically, and there are many more that one can study. There's something that one could call a fruit fly example that in a lot of the applied math papers pops up is, is where you sort of have a diffusion equation, which is sort of, you know, you have a diffusivity or if it's an, uh, from electrodynamics, it might be a conductivity function that is sort of given on your domain X, which is maybe say the disc or, or, or some, torso of a, of a patient that you try to image non-invasively. And so the, the elliptic equation that sort of models the dynamics uh, in this case, when it's in a steady state, is just this PD. So you have the gradient uh, and the divergence operator here. You have maybe some source term and some boundary conditions, okay? And so you then want to determine the coefficient F theta from seeing the solution U of your PD. And uh, you could also, look at some other uh, PDs that are sort of of a different nature where you have a given differential operator D, could be the Laplacian or some vector field, geodesic vector field or something that pops up in X-ray problems. And then you perturb it by some zero order term, which is some potential. Now, if you take the Laplacian here, then this would just be the steady state uh, Schrodinger equation. One can mention that we're here at the Schrodinger Institute. Um, um, if you take another X, uh, like if, if D would be a first order operator uh, coming from sort of, you know, scanning through a medium by certain directions and angles, this would be an X-ray problem, yeah? Um, and so in these cases, you could say that really what you observe is the solution of a partial differential equation, and you want to find the unknown coefficient that sort of describes this PD. And these maps in these two examples and in many other examples are uh, just nonlinear, okay? So um, when you look at the application, so I'm not saying that the regression function is a nonlinear function on the domain, but the dependence of the functional, like of the solution of the PD on the parameter, so the the theta, this map, this forward map is nonlinear. Okay, so that of course means that you don't have a linear regression mode. Yeah. Easy to compute, or it's difficult to go from theta to g of theta. So, so if this is an elliptic PD, then you can go to finite elements or whatever. Or maybe recently you might use uh, deep learning methods to solve elliptic PDs. This is something you know. Uh, sitting in the last row will tell you how to do this very quickly. Uh, it's sort of standard textbook numerical PD. Yeah? Uh, certainly for when you do this for an aggregate and so on, you know, you start to ask, well, how do you do this efficiently? But we'll typically assume in our model that the evaluation of the G map at theta is something we can do computationally yeah? by some numerical solver of a PD. Um, and the question now is somehow, how do I confront sort of how can I solve the inverse problem? So particularly in these examples I've given you here, the differential operator itself is actually linear. So solving the PD is uh, something you can do by linear methods, no? it's like a matrix inverse basically. But the inverse map that goes from sort of, you know, state, so when you go back from, when you want to recover the dependence of the solution of the PD from your coefficient is nonlinear. Okay? So even though the base PD is linear, the going back map is nonlinear. And of course, you can play this also when the base PD is nonlinear, and then this evaluation question will become a hard one, but, but it's really well posed uh, for us for the moment. Okay, so I'm just writing this down. So if you do the standard first thing that a statistician would do, you write down the d squares criterion for this uh, problem, uh, you look at the deviations of the responses from the explana explanation coming from your forward map. This is now in the relevant parameter theta that you would optimize over. This is a nonlinear map. Okay, so so in particular, it's non-convex, is quadratic. Yeah, so um, so it's not so clear what you're gonna do. Yeah? So if you just run a naive optimizer, there is all these problems, local optima and and, and whatever. Yeah, so, so it's not not clear that you get any kind of guarantees. It's not even clear if you do this in high dimensions that it's solvable in polynomial time. Maybe in G of theta, the PD part is a linear map, but F of theta makes it nonlinear in theta. In your examples. No, so so even if f of theta would be the identity just theta, the math. But think of this like in the Schrödinger equation. If you do this like an ODE, this is just an exponential. Yeah? So the solution is e to the line integral. Now, right? if you do this with the Laplace equation, then if you understand the idea of Schrödinger was that you don't do the line integrals along fixed lines, but you have some kind of ground motion, and you solve it along ground motion. On average, you solve this p, which is the final cap formula. Yeah? So, but this is still like a, a path integral exponential. So, so even without modeling the coefficient here in a nonlinear way, the solution map is nonlinear. So you can't just, it's not a modeling question, it's a physical question in nonlinearity. Because f of theta is inside the linear operator, not outside. 
Yes, so I mean, you could typically these coefficients, the conductivity has to be positive. So since I'm later going to want to use a linear space to model it, I can't just declare it to be the identity. So I will take some linear function like e to the theta. But this is not where the difficulty of the nonlinearity comes from, because that's a modeling step. The difficulty comes from the non explicit nonlinearity of the solution map of the PD, because in multi dimensions, of course, I can't do with an OD solve to just write e to the integral. Uh, it's something different. It's a, a, it exists the solution, but I have no analytical expression for the nonlinear. Okay, so um, okay. So what do people do? I'm obviously not the first that studies this. So, so Andrew Stewart, who is now at Caltech, has a chair for computational mathematics there, in, in maybe 12 years ago, wrote a very famous paper in Actual America. Um, where he just said, well, we can solve all these problems by base methods. No? And this is not, it's, it's, it's something that maybe goes back to Laplace and even earlier that when people run into hard statistical problems, there's always sort of a quick solution to just say you're Bayesian and then you keep fingers crossed and you say that this has to work because, well, I don't know why. Yeah? Uh, but, but so it's, it's a paper that has been very influential. And in a, in a way, the whole title of this workshop thematic program is Computational Uncertainty Quantification PD. And you know, if you look, there's a SIAM journal on uncertainty quantification. And so there's a big community of people who like to use these Bayesian methods to solve these nonlinear inverse problems. They seem to work empirically rather well, um, but guarantees as statisticians would like to see them or maybe as computational you know, also rigorous computational guarantees for these algorithms that one is going to use to on, on data sets are more complicated um, so what do you do typically well the Bayesian of course just starts with some prior which is just a, 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 a probability measure on the function space of theta so if theta is some conductivity you could maybe choose a random Gaussian field on your domain and then maybe exponentiate it to make it positive and so this is this is sort of the model you would use the prior and then you, of course you have the likelihood which in a Gaussian regression model is just the exponential um, of the negative least squares fit so you get a posterior distribution which is you know if you look at it is actually not very deep no all you're doing is you take the likelihood and you reweight it philosophically by a penalty that comes from your prior when you use a Gaussian process prior. Yeah? So, so somehow it has like, it's just emperor's new clothes. No? So you just have basically a penalized least squares problem. But, but of course, once you see this posterior distribution, you have to choose this reproducing kernel Hilbert space norm, which for a Gaussian process prior sort of determines the covariance structure of the prior you use, which typically could be here some Sobolev space or something like that. Um, you can say, well, maybe now I have just the same problem again, but of course, uh, you don't have to maximize this. Yeah? So you could try to maximize it, but you can also just try to do something else and not maximize it and just use, uh, your, this is a, a probability measure in a high dimensional space. So you could try to compute its mean, compute the average instead of the mode. Um, and how do you do this? Well, we'll talk about MCMC methods in a second, but, but you can see how somehow there's a departure from the standard sort of optimization paradigm here um, that is particularly for the statistician is interesting to investigate uh, what are the correct statistical theory tools to somehow study the performance of, of this posterior mean. Yeah? Sure. Um, it's not clear to me for the physical problems of interest whether you'd be more interested in the posterior mean of theta or the posterior mean of the paths f of theta. You, so you mean the... Yeah, f of theta at each the function of theta that, that is of interest in the PDE parameterized by the theta. So, so you mean, so, so there are like three things. Uh, yeah. So there's sort of, in, in this typical, like in a physical model conductivity, there would be theta, which is sort of a Gaussian process. Then you need to make it positive, which is the f of theta. This is for me just like some base plus e to the theta, something like that. No? So you just make it positive. And the crucial thing is now, the solution u theta of the PD for this coefficient. Uh -huh. so, and this is sort of the solution of the PD. So you could find the posterior mean of the u of theta. So if you want to do what they call forward u q, yeah. then you want to actually just recover the solution of the PD. And for this, uh, you can debate whether you want to do it this way, but you might still want to do it this way. If you want to do inverse UQ, you're actually not interested in predicting sort of the, think of you do electric computer tomography in, in a torso. So if you apply a voltage and then record the currents that come out on the other things. So then you can add, so you see this, this sort of uh, current distribution after applying many voltages. And then you can say, what I actually want to find is the conductivity in sub. 
and were constructed from sort of these non-invasive measurements. And the conductivity inside would be the F theta. And that's the inverse problem. You can also, of course, say, I actually don't, you know, I just want to reconstruct properly the currents that I've recorded and then denoise them. Then you want to find the U theta, just the solution of the PD. But the, the hard problem here is to go back because the solution map that sends the theta or the F theta, whichever of the two into that, is non explicit. This is, you know, solutions of PDs, they exist by some application of some theorem functional analysis, but you can't write down an expression for them. My my point was just you're finding the mean of theta, and I'm wondering whether that's what you really want the mean of. Well, okay, you can of course parameterize it as you like. If you use the Gaussian process model, um, then you will take a linear parameter space for theta, and if you later on to use MCMC, typically you use a Markov chain that wants to explore space, so it's convenient to do this in the linear space where the Markov chain is naturally defined. But once you have theta, you can just either go for the F theta by exponentiating it, which is cheap. Or if you want to go to the forward thing, you have to solve another PD. But that's also the forward problem is usually not the problem if you use a standard elliptic PD solver. But the inverse problem is the thing that we can't use a standard numerical method for. I guess if the theta to F theta map is nonlinear, then you do like F of the mean is not the mean of the Fs. So you need some kind of maybe Lipschitz assumption that, or, or you know, some tail assumption. Uh, I mean, you can actually, what is the definition? If you can sample from the posterior, you can average F of theta just as easily yeah. as you can average theta. Yeah. So it's, it's, but, but it's natural to pose the MCMC problem on the linear space, I think, because we're going to do like some gradient method. Sure. Well, the MC, you're going to do on the theta land. I'm just... So, so you see here already how the algorithm works. No? So, so you like the, we want to connect to maybe gradient descent methods. So, so what you're going to do when you actually compute this posterior mean, you're going to of course use some MCMC. No? So, so what you're going to do is you take um, the log posterior density, which is up to constant I care about the likelihood minus this penalty term. And one, I mean, there are many ways to do MCMC. Yeah? So here I'm just ex ex explaining one algorithm. There are others that you can do. Um, but uh, if I do maybe the one that is clo most closely connected to methods that people in uh, deep learning would use, you would just uh, you take these usual gradient steps with some step size delta from this uh, log posterior, which is basically just looking at the least squares criterion, and then you have this Gaussian penalty there, which doesn't really make a huge difference really in the end, and you put your Gaussian innovations. And since you don't want the MCMC to collapse, unlike in stochastic gradient descent, you're not going to let delta go to zero here in the thought experiment. You're going to keep delta fixed because eventually, of course, you want to, if you want to compute the posterior mean, you don't want to get stuck in a local optimum. Huh? So you need to keep wandering around if you want to, if you think particularly this is a multimodal surface, uh, you don't want to get stuck anywhere. Huh? Okay, so, and so once you have that, you can then compute, for instance, the posterior mean just by averaging after some burning time. Uh, the ergodic averages along the Markov chain. Of course, you will need to prove something about the performance of this Markov chain, but you can certainly run this code, and, and people do run this code a lot of times uh, in these PD models. Yeah? And they also use other Markov chain methods. Um, and okay, so the statistical questions you can ask, okay, what, what, is the, what is the statistical and algorithmic meaning of, for instance, this, this MCMC mean once I've computed it? And then what they'd like to do in particular is what they call uncertainty quantification. So you don't just report the point estimate, which is the posterior mean, but they actually show these curve clouds, which are sort of plotting the, the MCMC draws. And then they go to the engineers and tell them these are confidence sets. Yeah? And of course, these applied PD people don't have any clue what a confidence set is, to say this very bluntly here. Uh, and you see loads of papers that they show you this picture and then they show some true function. But who tells you that really the true picture is not this one where you're completely far off? Yeah, and so this is the question, when are Bayesian credible sets, would, because really what you're showing here is something that is the quantiles of the posterior distribution, is there a way to explain that these are actual confidence sets? Yeah, are these error bars that they show the engineers something that a statistician would actually give a signature and, and sign off, or is this just propagating the randomness of the prior to the engineer, okay? So, um, I'm sorry if I'm a bit provocative, but I think it's important for people from this uh, applied PD community to understand that these are things that statisticians need to think about. Okay, so okay, so what are the questions we can ask if you want to do some mathematics here and prove terms that these algorithms get can work? Um, well, the first is you, you, you first, it's not clear that this posterior mean or the posterior distribution itself sits in the right place. No, we're looking at a complicated nonlinear regression model. 
So even before I think about computation and error bars and confidence sets, the question is, is it actually true that say that the posterior distribution actually concentrate most of its mass at the actual parameter that sort of generated the, the, the data? Huh? Not clear at all. I mean, if I've talked to someone like Andrew Stewart, he knew, of course, he wrote some papers on this, he tried to give some conditions there, which were never quite satisfactory. So it's clearly a question that you need to answer. That how, however, sometimes sometimes people who apply Bayesian methods in the sciences are somehow they think it's enough to be Bayesian and they don't have to ask this question. And I, I don't agree with that. Uh, the next question, of course, is even if you can solve that problem, then you can say, well, I, you know, Art van der Waart has done important work in the last 20 years trying to understand when Bayesian posterior distributions concentrate in the right place in high and infinite dimensional models. Well, if you prove that, you still haven't said anything about the MCMC algorithm you're using. You have just said that the theoretical posterior distribution sits somewhere in the right place. But the question, of course, is are these algorithmic outputs when I run my MCMC actually resembling this quality of the posterior distribution, or uh, is this mark of changes wandering off somewhere else? So that's the second question is computability. And of course, these posterior distributions are not log concave. The least squares criterion is not the negative least squares. Yeah, so the least squares criterion is not convex. So these could well be NP-hard problems. Yeah? Whether or not I can find, in, like by any polynomial time algorithm, the posterior mean in this problem, there's no reason why this should be possible. Yeah? Uh, in high dimensions, there are several barriers. No, one is dimension. The other one is also if it's multimodal, there might be a spike of size n. And so you, who tells you that your MCMC is not going to take exponentially large time in sample size to get over that, that spike. OK. And then the last one is like, even if you, you know, if you can ask, answer the first two, you, you can ask then, well, if this is actually real or possible in some sense, can we give some guarantees that these uncertainty quantification error bars are actually valid confidence sets? So that we can use them if you want to test whether the Higgs boson exists or not. No, you want to know that your, your three sigma is a real three sigma and not just something that comes from the prior. Okay, so, so these are the, the questions. And so I, I have done some work in this direction, maybe giving some first guarantees in, in this way in the last five years. And I, I, so I spent the spring giving a sort of graduate course at ETH and I wrote some lecture notes up on this, which should be online at some point next month. Uh, but I'll try to... So, and there's lots of papers, not lots, but some papers on it. I'll try to talk you through some of the main ideas of the work we've done now. And there's many things will start to matter. One, of course, is we need that the ground truth somehow is, has some regularity, like it always is the case in non-parametric statistics or in high-dimensional statistics. You will need to choose a reasonable prior for which Gaussian process priors, for instance, are often good if they're expressed in a basis that is sort of compatible with PD structure. So if you have like the eigen, you know, if you have some, if your prior expands nicely in eigenfunctions that, that connect to properties of the Laplace operator, for instance, this will work. If you use this on a neural network or something like that, it's already less clear, but you could still in principle express your prior in a different approximation theory paradigm and hope that, that some of these conditions that I will kind of use and verify for a particular basis might also work for these other bases. And then one crucial thing, as you expect, is somehow, it depends, of course, on the PD map G, but also on its linearization, because it will allow me to describe local curvature of the problem, okay? And we will be able to leverage PD theory to actually get some local curvature in these problems, which somehow, uh, if you don't use it, you don't see it. Okay, so... So this posterior consistency are the first few things we proved. Um, so indeed, you can give a sensible set of assumptions on all these G map, so the solution map of the PD, the ground truth, the prior, and maybe some other things that allow you to really show that the posterior doesn't, you know, so, so it does not just solve the, 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 the Bayesian method, because it is likelihood based, will typically solve the regression problem for you. Yeah, so it will mean the regression problem means it estimates the U theta well. But of course, we need to be able to go back sort of from these regression maps that we can recover from the, you know, in the Hellinger distance in this problem is basically this L2 distance on these forward maps. And so if you have something that is called a stability estimate in the PD literature, you can somehow go back from the G of thetas to the thetas. And of course, you can try to prove this. This is a thing that you have to prove for concrete PD. It's a quantitative injectivity estimate that tells you somehow if I find the solutions of the PDs, 
I can get some implied bound on the distance of these parameters. So the important thing is this does not need a reconstruction formula for the inverse map. Like in the linear, linear inverse problem, Radon transform, if you actually have an inversion formula and you can try to make it robust to noise, in these nonlinear problems, you do not have an inversion formula. It just doesn't exist. You just know it's inje injective. So yes, there exists an inverse, but it doesn't mean you can ever compute it. The way you supply this in the base method is you never need an inversion problem. All you do is you run your MCMC, so you need to compute gradients of the forward map, which means that each time you have to solve your forward problem by some elliptic PD solver, you can do that. There is no inversion step, but if you have stability, then this Bayesian method will actually solve the inverse problem. Yeah? And so we show this for some, for a class of nonlinear such problems now in some papers. Um, this has also been extended uh, by Sven Wang and Sergio Sagapio to some non-Gaussian priors, which are more like of Bezos prior type with exponential tails, so they may, might be able to promote sparsity. So, so this does not just stick to Gaussian process priors, but, but that's sort of the first point where you develop this theory. And these contraction rate theorems, which tell, oops, sorry, uh, which tell you that the posterior contracts typically translate in the convergence rate for the posterior mean as well. And uh, um, the rates actually depend on the PD. So some of these, like the famous Cardaron problem from uh, inverse problems, from this only has logarithmic rates. So you, some of these problems are very hard. They're severely ill-posed if you want. Yeah? And you can prove that no better rate than log n to a power can be obtained. Whereas in some of the more like traditional examples, well, not traditional, but maybe sort of X-ray and elliptic PDs and things, you get actually algebraic rates. Um, the proportional to dimension or? Uh, yes. So, the, 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 well, which dimension? So, the, there's two dimensions. So, one is the dimension of the space in which you discretize, and, and this is already expressed in these rates here. There's also the dimension of the space in which your PD is posed. So like, the, if you want the regression function, is a function of little d variables. And then you have this usual non parametric dependence, little d in the denominator of the exponent. Yeah. yeah. yeah related to this, the uh, the observations are finite dimensional, so could be infinite dimensional as well. It's a very good question. So for the Cardano problem, this is an operator value problem in principle. So, so in principle, your data should be some operator in infinite dimensions. Of course, that's not how you measure it. Uh, so the way we prove this, we introduce an abstract Gaussian white noise model in, in a space of field street operators. It's pretty abstract, but we have a section where you where we give three concrete um, sort of matrix valued um, uh, observation spaces where the sort of you know you can sort of vary the dimension of the vector space in which your data takes values and then go to infinity and you, then we show the sort of equivalence of you know the constants of these observational models. This is not so great for positive results. You want to say well something works for this model and in principle works for the other, but in some sense in part alone the main mathematical feature was to get the negative result, which is the lower bound for the rate. And if you prove this in one Lekam equivalent model, it translates to all the other models. So this result primarily says that for boundary measures for smooth conductivities in this Cardano problem, you cannot get beyond log n rates. And this is actually robust to the kind of measurement model you take for operators in this particular case. In, in other PDs, so these other PDs, except for Cardano, are actually such that your data is at most matrix value in a fixed finite dimensional space, so this problem doesn't pop up. In some of the future PDs we're looking at, this problem does pop up, and then the discretization of the functional data that you have becomes a serious issue. Um, and I would say, in principle, in statistical science, we have tools to deal with functional data analysis, and this should also apply here, but I can't give you any PD-specific answers yet, but this is a very important question, I agree. Maybe closer. What is an observation? Can you go back to your, to your example of PD? So you which one? The, one with the example. Okay. Uh, so here, what do you observe? You observe a G and U, a bubble G and U. Or... So you observe the. So, so think about this this way, you know. So go there. So you have some domain. That's where you do your imaging. Yeah. So then you take a bunch of points X I. That you sample, say, uniformly at random, observe your xi, the design points. Yeah? And so the solution of the PD is some map that might look like this here. And then this is what you observe is the, the solution of the PD at the point xi. And this is what I call g of theta. No? So, and then you have every time you make such a measurement, you, you make a, an error. Yeah? So, and then you have an n dimensional vector. Which is just regression. It's just regression where the regression function is the solution of a PDE that depends on the original parameter. You get a single PDE. 
The PD is fixed, but for each state, in principle, is a different PD. Okay. But, but it could be in some of these, for instance, you could solve these equations also when U is matrix valued and not just a scalar function. No? So, so you know, there's no reason why you couldn't do that. And in this case, you this this picture is not appropriately long, of course, but then you, your response is why I would not be one dimensional, but you could have a whole matrix or vector. And then actually this pops up. And in the limit, you get this function like these operator valued data points that, that uh, Fabio was talking about. This can also pop up. But uh, it gets, you know, it can get as complicated as you like. In these model examples, you actually just have a scalar response. Um, where was I? I think here. Yeah, okay, so we found some rates now for these models. And the typical ingredient is always. You show in the Hellinger distance using the van der Waals theory, you can solve this L2 problem, and then you use a stability estimate. Because it's nonlinear and exponential, this never holds in the whole parameter space, this stability estimate. The injectivity collapses. There's no injectivity, quantitative injectivity estimate where this constant doesn't collapse when you take the infimum of all theta. But it does hold on a fixed ball for my regularization norm, which shows why it is important to do regularization here, like either by a prior, or if you want to use a penalty, that's sort of the same. You need somehow a priori to know that you're searching only over a fixed such ball in the neighborhood of the ground truth, because otherwise this injectivity will collapse. Yeah? So that's an important aspect of the theory that that's why regularization in nonlinear inverse problems is even more important than in linear inverse problems. Yeah? Um, so here's an implementation of this for a nonlinear problem, just to do a mental break. Um, you know, I run, we implemented this for these non abelian X ray problems that, that run, that pop up in, in neutron tomography. Not because we care about neutron tomography, but I was working with this applied mathematician, Francois Monat, who is in the University of California. And, uh, you know, it just works really well. No? So here you have like a sample size 200, 400, 800. This is of 100,000 MCMC iterations. So it's not super fast, but we didn't optimize the MCMC here. And the third row, only with 800 x-rays that we shot here, it already looks very much like the truth, which I haven't plotted. Yeah? So, so these things are empirically pretty robust also in nonlinear settings. Um, now, of course, the question is, what does this, how does this picture, which is running an MCMC, connect to the actual posterior contraction rate, which is a theoretical result about some random probability measure that comes from Bayesian formalism. So it's not clear that the theorems that we proved on this slide have anything to do with these pictures. Yeah, and, and actually, I was in Nova Wolfach uh, maybe three years ago, talked about these consistency theorems. It was Francis and uh, Philippe Rigolet and some others, and they gave me a really hard time telling me, well, okay, you know, you're solving some NP hard problem here, so yeah, you prove consistency, but it's not computable. So then I said, well, yeah, guys, you're probably right. So I'll just continue doing my theory. No, but actually what happened is that with Sven Wang, who is here, I, I, we started to investigate what you can actually say about mixing times of, of Markov chains towards the equilibrium distributions in these PD models. And, and like in a way, now three years later, Francis, I can give you some first answers to your questions, which were really important back then. So I actually uh, wanted to acknowledge that here. So, okay, so what happens is that um, when you do gradient descent, well, no, so when you do what, what the MCMC people call this Langevin, yeah? so they, they do a stochastic gradient descent where however the variance of your noise distribution doesn't go to zero, so you sort of keep exploring. Yeah? So there are some nice results that actually go back to Emery Bakri and, and then also sort of focke planck theory by Felix Otto and so on. I tell you that, the, that this, this Langevin, like the, the, the um, D-dimensional diffusion process that solves sort of this standard diffusion equation, um, works really well when the limiting target measure you're trying to sample from is log concave with a strong bound on its sort of uh, negative Hessian. Yeah? So now, of course, in our case, we're not log concave because this is equivalent to G being linear. However, there is something that we could prove um, on the condition is that these posterior distributions are basically always in high dimensions. Uh, where did I leave it? Uh, they are log concave locally at least. And I mean, I can... I'll put the theorem maybe a bit later if people are interested. So what I'm saying is this, posterior, of course, I can't draw this in one dimension, but these posteriors, they might be very wiggly, but actually then locally with very high probability, they start to look like that. And this has to do on the assumption that is related to invertibility of the Fisher information in low dimensions, something that we can make quantitative in high dimensions by this condition I'll mention in a second. And the second ingredient is not only do they locally look like this near the true point like this, but actually by the consistency theorems that I've told you, all the mass is in here. 
So basically, if I ignore what is out there and I can somehow initialize into a region where I'm locally log concave, I should be able to sample from this by gradient methods in polynomial time. And uh, that's really the idea of the whole thing. And we made it quantitative, making it quantitative in some concrete PD models was a lot of work. So we have a 70 page paper on this now in James that you can read or not read, but, but you can, uh, you know, it's just what happens, yeah? So, so the condition, and then of course, this is the point, you know, you can say, okay, we're just doing some PD estimates because we have nothing else to do. But really what's going on here, if you fit this problem without using the PD structure, you have a high dimensional problem, it's just not feasible in general. The PD structure allows you to understand that your problem actually is locally convex. Yeah? So this is not something that you can make an assumption on. It's something you can, it can be true or not, and it depends on the PD. And, and we proved it for a few PDs now that it actually happens. And it happens fairly generically from the examples we've seen so far. So I can write down this condition. The, the Hessian of the negative log likelihood, of course, at the true point is basically reducing to this quadratic form where the gradient or the derivative acts in generic directions V. So you just you take the Hessian of the least squares criteria and then you get the first order term and the second order term near the true value is just perturbatively small, okay? And then, then this gradient stability condition, as we call it, can actually be checked for most of the PD examples I wrote down before. And this is not trivial. So you use kind of the whole machinery of elliptic PDs or of X-ray problems or of other problems, and you kind of have to go to these PD books and, and, and like, you know, learn what, what, what is underlying. Basically, all the isomorphism theorems in PD theory that tell you I can solve this PD because there's an isomorphism between function space, they start to look like a local convexity of the negative log likelihood. Yeah? So we, even though these things are kind of often known, they mean that there is here's one reason why these PD problems are actually solvable because there is some local curvature genuinely, even in high dimensions. And uh, we can, so the capital D now is the dimension of a discretization space, and we can quantify these lower bounds. Uh, for each PD, you get a different kappa, and we can work out what these kappa constants are for some examples. And then if you do this Langevin type MCMC that I had a few slides ago, and you initialize, so initialization is something we need to discuss. Um, I was just talking about this with Gerard Benarus a few weeks ago at ETH Zurich. Of course, cold start MCMC is often very hard. And we're talking here about warm start MCMC, which says that, you know, of course, the distribution does not look like that with probability one. Yeah? So there are actually fluctuations, but what I'm saying is that they sort of under this condition eventually have so little frequent this probability that we can forget these little fluctuations and that the gradient method will perform as if it was a log concave target locally. And so, um, if you initialize somehow in a reasonable region, yeah, then, uh, and reasonable can be much bigger than the actual contraction rate. Yeah? And something that particular when the dimension is low here, this starts to be a very large region, but in high dimensions, it becomes smaller, but we can quantify it. Yeah? So then you can give a polynomial time mixing time bound for the Wasserstein mixing time of your uh, Langevin method. Yeah? So this means, it doesn't mean yet that you can compute things, but it tells you actually, if you run this Markov chain coming from Langevin, you will actually eventually um, explore all the features of this posterior distribution, at least in Wasserstein distance to the true posterior distributions after polynomial time of Monte Carlo iteration. Notice that, um, so for instance, there's a very nice paper, which was back in 2019, my off the shelf answer to Francis' question by Martin Heira, Andrew Stewart and, and Sebastian Warmer, um, where they show that another PCN scheme used in this literature, another MCMC scheme used in this literature has a dimension free spectral gap. So that's all very nice. It's a beautiful math result, but um, it's dimension free. But if this spike, and like if you have a local spike like this here, and this is like n to any power epsilon. Yeah, and this is something that you could see, you no? Know? So if you have a local optimum that is just n to epsilon, like has so some significant size and also some significant sort of volume, also n to the epsilon, then this PCN scheme, even though it's polynomial time in dimension, it will just take an exponential time in n to get over this spike. So it means what we could call the informative limit, where we get lots of samples, then the MCMC break to one. No, you want the MCMC to work precisely. You want it to work when you have lots of data. And so you want to be always polynomial time in both N and T. Yeah. And overcome that spurious spike. Yeah, so I mean, so obviously we kind of rule it out that we initialize into the right region. Um, but uh, um, so how to answer this, I guess. So I've been working on computational hardness uh, Uh, so, so what should I say? How do I answer this question? Um, 
Um, so, okay, so the way our the, the way our theorems are proved that over rule that out, we basically say this doesn't happen here yeah, with high probability. Yeah? And uh, when you're in there, when you're in there, I, I would still uh, maybe I would still think that the PCN is going to take an exponential time to climb over, even in the unimodal case. Yeah? So, so, so I guess my picture if it's if it's log well, okay, yeah. we'll get up there. Um, the no, issue is, is the acceleration the of the, we need the acceleration of the gradient in high dimensions. No? So the, the thing here is that when the PCN is like a random walk type algorithm with a is, oh with I know I don't know what yeah, okay. I don't so, know. So this kind of goes like in simple steps and it doesn't actually explore. So, so I mean, I guess uh, my, my conjecture would be if you just do a random walk optimization method, it might also take very long to get over here. Whereas if you do a graded method, it will, of course, accelerate when you have a spike. So, so I agree, my picture was not, well, my picture wasn't wrong, but it wasn't maybe uh, explaining all that. Well, I don't yet understand what's preventing these competing modes in your. Um, Differential equation uh, setting. So well, why why is there just one? I mean, so it so it basically it tells you that to so see that the the Hessian so this local parameter here yes comes from a PD and that is local no? because if you write down the I don't believe it locally yeah, but, but, but okay but then it's like n times t to the minus kappa zero because you have n of the likelihood huh? so so this is the, the curvature per observation is that. So the thing that drives the coverage is pretty large. And then depending on dimension, the perturbative term is basically a large O of the distance to theta <laughs> right. And of course, this gets very large. So this doesn't have to be all that accurate to be absorbed in here. And what I'm just assuming is that I can initialize into the region where this is absorbed by that. So in some sense, the global polynomial time argument still needs to be complemented by the existence of an initializer theorem, which for instance for the Schrodinger equation example, which we did in the first paper, we disproved polynomial time initializers, not MCMC based, but still exist. Now you can play this game for other PDEs, and I do not believe that uh, cold start MCMC will not solve the initialization problems because we can give algorithmic negative results. I mean, I also had some papers in the answer for a few years ago where you give sort of cold start lower bounds and we can adapt them to these models as well. So I do not believe that the answer to the initialization problem is one that you can address by MCMC, but by other methods. Yeah? Yeah. Maybe just one thing to add. So in this trade off of the two terms where you need the second one to be absorbed in the first one, I do think that the second one generally can also be of order n. But the key thing here is that the exponent, I don't know what you call it, kappa zero or alpha yeah. zero, uh, really comes from the ill posedness of the inverse problem. Yes. It has nothing to do with the regularity of the truth or anything, right? So for instance, if you look at, um, this is really just another scaling. Um, and if, if this kappa zero is small enough, might even be zero, uh, then you really kind of get uh, a non-shrinking region into which you have to initialize. Um, yeah, so the, the kappa zero, these are ill posed problems, no? So they still, like you perform a smooth thing. So this kappa zero, if you do standard regression, the kappa zero would be zero. So then you get a constant region of, of curvature. And so I think if you transpose this into a, a non PD picture, you would just need to, you would kind of need a bad but still reasonable initializer, which of course is much easier in polynomial time than like really solving the actual problem. So we say that once you can get into a reasonable region expressed by the curvature of your PD problem, which comes from some isomorphism theorem from PD theory, then you can solve the problem by MCMC. And for uncertainty quantification, of course, is somehow we use MCMC because we want to learn the quantiles and give error bars, and not maybe because we want to find the posterior mean per se. So, yeah, Fabian. Another question on the lunch on uh, um, this results do you have to uh, just the step size uh, in the Langevin, I mean, they, sure. they have to be linked to, to the number of observations and the... Yes. So, so there is a choice of gamma, which again depends polynomial and N, D, and, and, and the precision level, and that's how this term will go. It doesn't work for any step size, but... So just, just to clarify some, some terms or some statements that have been shown uh, so this high dimensional uh, discretization space 
So, so here, for example, yeah. uh, so the theta is infinite dimensional. This is some set of PD coefficients, uh, uh, say, say L infinity, or C1 or something. And then RD is, of course, Euclidean space. So, so there is something in between which uh, is a basis. So you, you have to have a basis, uh, and then RD is just a set of coefficients of, of this thetas uh, depend on a finite number D of parameters. And uh, uh, the, the stability constants of these bases has to be hidden in the wiggle, wiggle greater than or equal. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, so, so two things. There's, of course, a bias. You have an infinite dimensional object that you approximate from a high dimensional basis. So, there will be an approximation error. And so, you need your basis to be able to deal with that approximation error, which is a fairly standard. But, of course, it needs the capital D to grow in order to offset sort of this approximation error. And once you have realized that D has to grow, whether or not this curvature inequality holds for a given PD depends on the PD, but also, and that's a very important point, thanks for asking that, it depends on how you discretize. So here, for instance, if I take my elliptic PD from the diffusion equation or Schrodinger equation, then here I have to basically, our theorem is use the eigenfunction of the standard Laplacian, if you think on the torus, it would be the trigonometric polynomials, yeah? so as a basis. Now, if you use a neural network here, we don't know if we have this curvature because you need to actually input non-trivial PD theory, like a, like an isomorphism theory between solar spaces for a solution of an elliptic PD. I don't know if this holds for a neural network. Probably not. No. So, so great question. If anyone can answer it, I think it would be a major major so issue. If you use a neural net and you're not careful about it, you're going to have lots of. Uh, Optimizers just from the sure. symmetries that are involved. Yes. So, so, so I have strong doubts. I have just one. Yeah. So I have strong doubts that this inequality, which we prove when you choose a particular basis, which is numerically sensible, but it's somehow a more traditional approximation theory than what we're doing deep learning. I have strong doubts that you can check this condition easily. Uh, but I have not also not looked into it. But it would be a very interesting question no? because this elliptic the solution theory for PDs was typically between spaces that align well, like with the M-functions of the Laplace and the trigonometry polynomials in the simplest case. When you suddenly take compositional structures, it's, it's not clear that this will go hand in hand. But, but all I wanted to say is that uh, there is Euclidean space on the left. This is RD. And yeah. then on the right is theta, which is an infinite dimensional, let's say, separable uh, yeah. Hilbert or Banner space. And then there is something in between, which is uh, the basis you choose for theta. Yes. So let's say maybe it would be better to write theta d, which is a, a d dimensional subspace of the function space theta. Yeah, I mean, and then depending on what basis you choose, uh, the, the hidden constant in this greater or equal. Yes, it depends on the basis. basis. So this is not true for every d-dimensional subspace. It is true for a particular d-dimensional subspace. In your papers, of course, you uh, are very careful to exactly pinpoint uh, what basis. I mean, you have you mentioned yes. the trig functions, PCAs, uh, uh, wavelets, clients, or something. But these are uh, representation systems with uh, good stability properties in L2, H1, and yes. so on. Absolutely. And then what you say is exactly uh, as you say it here. Absolutely. Thanks. I mean, I'm sorry, this is just slides. I mean, it's obviously the papers and the lecture notes are yeah. more detailed. But, uh, okay, so I don't know how, how much time I have now, but uh, five minutes. Okay. Okay. So, okay, we can compare this mixing time result by actually a, a concentration inequality for the actual Markov chain that you draw from running the graded method. And you can get concentration with nice exponential bounds for Lipschitz functions. And this also gives you the computation of the posterior mean. Uh, I won't talk too much about this now. It's fairly standard. Let me just use the last few minutes to ask the uh, talk about the last question. Now, let's suppose we have posterior consistency and we, for a moment, believe that we've actually used um, a, a discretization space. We do actually expect the mixing time to work. Of course, I don't tell you how to actually, when to actually stop the Markov chain. I just tell you there's a polynomial stopping time. So, in practice, it, this is not useful, but it clarifies one aspect that the problem under certain conditions is not NPR. And so, you have to ask yourself, what what can I now read off of these error bars that people use for uncertain quantification? No, so in classical mathematical statistics, there's a theorem which is called the Benchstein for Mises theorem, which holds for fixed low dimensional parameter spaces. It goes back to Laplace, in fact. 
um, and was really proved by the GAM, and maybe the only readable proof is in by Van der Waal. Um, but uh, it says that posterior distribution is one of the nice regularity conditions that we teach in our mathematical statistics courses are always approximated by certain Gaussian distributions, and the, inver inver in the inverse Fisher information pops up as the covariance of this normal distribution. Okay, so um, so, so of course. Uh, somehow you can ask yourself, can I do something like this in infinite dimensions or high dimensions? And the simple answer is no. Uh, there's some classical uh, negative results actually by uh, Michael Friedman and also Ian Johnston have worked on this and, and Percy Diaconis and so on, that this theorem doesn't generalize for free at all. Right? And even in standard sequence space when everything is conjugate in infinite dimensions, you can give simple counterexamples that this is not true. Now what uh, Ismail Castillo and I did is we sort of gave a more semi-parametric flavor to this problem and said that, well, actually, you can have these terms in a weak enough topology in infinite dimensions. I will not talk about this now. In the, but you can run this program that Ismail Castillo and I developed on these PD problems. And you, you, know, you, get, you run into the main traffic you run into is what is the equivalent of an invertible Fisher information in the PD world. Because of course, I will linearize my forward maps. You get some other solution operator of an inhomogeneous PD, and you adjoint it with itself. And then you have to, well, what does it mean that this is invertible? A priori, you have no clue. And it leads actually to interesting PD questions that I started to run past some of my pure math colleagues in Cambridge, uh, particularly Gabriel Patanine. And so you, you kind of basically, if you understand semi parametric statistics, if you want to prove something like that, you need to solve this information equation. You need to sort of find points in its range for which you can invert it. So if you, let's say, for simplicity, only want to make inference not on theta naught, but just on an inner product with a fixed vector psi, just to make things easy to start with. And then psi could be maybe a generic direction, so you can reconstruct more complex objects from it. Um, then you have to solve a new PD, which com comes from this equation. You, know, you compute your i star i. These are sort of the linearization operator adjointed for the correct inner product. And then you can ask yourself, can I solve this equation? And then you play this for any of the PD examples. Yeah? So you can compute these linearizations are not explicitly given, but they are usually themselves solutions to other PD problems. So they have solutions and you can try to work yourself through this PD problem. So in a paper that was, uh, so actually for the Schrodinger equation fittingly since the Schrodinger Institute, I managed to prove the invertibility of this in a paper when I first started learning these things. Um, which maybe is, is now I wouldn't write this paper like this anymore, but but it's still it's still realized that there's hope in some PD problems that this can work. And then after talking to some of my colleagues, so they they activated some more non-trivial theory. Um, and what you can prove is that often for many PDs, you can actually invert this information operator. And then at least in the semi-parametric sense, you can actually say that the posterior mean at uh, the posterior draw, when you subtract the posterior mean from it say integrated against a nice test function, and then you can do this for a generic class of test functions, actually does converge to a normal. And you get a typical semi-parametric sort of camera lower bound in the limit. And now you have this inverse Fisher information operator popping up, which is basically the solution operator of this other PD. And so, so you can make this work for some PDs, which is a lot of hard work from the PD side. But in principle, you do expect exact Gaussian asymptotics for some of these PD problems. Yeah. yeah the invertibility from the condition for mixing or they no because so that's a great question thanks huh? so it's a great question so you see this <laughs> thank you it's good to almost do skate stage now huh? so, uh, so so this is in finite dimensions of course if you have fixed finite dimensional space you can have this you know an inverse exists because every Every linear map that is injective, you know, it has an inverse and it even has close range. Huh? But in infinite dimensions, this is, of course, not true. Huh? And so you could have this inequality and still not be able to solve the information equation that pops up in the abstract Lacan theory when you do a simple equivalent in the limiting experiment. Huh? So, and actually, so that's my last slide. Huh? So we solved this for a class of PDs. <laughs> and you can also show that the UQ works in for these PDs. Let me just finish with this. So then we go back to the fruit fly example that all the applied mathematicians like to study, which is this divergence, this diffusion equation. Yeah? You can show that the posterior is consistent and contracts, and you can even give like you can check this great instability condition. So you can give mixing time bounds for the FCMC. But we proved in a paper with Patanine that the Fisher information operator in the there's a theorem by Van der Waal that tells you if you want to have a root n estimable semi parametric problem, then the psi direction has to be in the range of the adjoint score operator of the problem. And this is necessarily sufficient for a root n consistent estimability, and therefore also for existence of kind of approximations. And for this PD, you can check the curvature uh, 
for mixing, but the information equation has no solution. As soon as psi, it could be any smooth function that is just like uh, has like an open set where it's supported zero. So from almost all directions, the PD problem is not solvable, but we still compute. And this is the point where there comes sort of idea that you can embed everything into an unlimiting experiment where things are invertible. In this PD world, you can give concrete, simple examples. The Fisher information universe does not exist, but in the finite dimensional approximation space, you still have curvature. Um, so there is no valid UQ, no Gaussian approximation, but there is, if you think of this, there is a log concave approximation. And why? Because log concave classes are infinite dimensional, Gaussians are low dimensional. And so this, in high dimensions, you shouldn't try to, in PD models, apply, try, you should perhaps not try to approximate from a Gaussian, but from a log concave thing, which for mixing times of gradient methods is just the same. And um, this example is really curious. It's actually, once you know what you're doing, not hard to prove. It uses PD arguments, but, but it is sort of more curious than deep. Um, okay, and so I, let me just finish here. I mean, I think we've understood more than when I last talked to Francis pre-COVID and, and others, but there's still many, many open questions here. Um, if you want to read up on something, so I think I wrote these lecture notes in Zurich. I haven't put them online yet. I'm still, still polishing to be there in, in July. If you, if you want a sneak preview, I can send them to you. Just send me an email. Um, and then some of the papers. So the first consistency theorem that we proved for these things is this paper. Then this Schrodinger, like the first fish information thing was in that paper. I think probably a good paper to start here is this one. Uh, if you're interested in uncertainty quantification and Benjamin for Mises. This computation time bounds gradient paper with Sven is uh, here. And these counter examples, uh, these are not ICML, but ICM uh, uh, is, is in this paper. And while I got this question, someone couldn't find the paper because it was not on ICML. But uh, uh, great, thanks so much for your attention. <laughs>